The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. The Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers at their business. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all with the sheep and the oxen out of the temple. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. You shall not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign have you to show us for this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scripture, the word which Jesus had spoken. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not trust himself to them because he knew all men and needed no one to bear witness of man. For he himself knew what was in man. The Gospel of the Lord. Lead questions for today. Question number one. The commandment number 10, which is Exodus chapter 20, verse 17 says, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's goods, your neighbor's house. You shall not covet. So, what is covetousness? And how is covetousness linked to greed and avarice? Question two. We saw in the gospel of today, our meek and gentle Jesus became furious. He was filled with rage in the temple. Why? And what kind of things do make you angry? Have you ever been angry? What kind of things do make you angry? Three. First Corinthians chapter 6 verse 19 says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Do you not know, speaking in the context of uh, adultery and fornication and all sexual sins, St. Paul says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? So how will you keep your body holy? In this age of widespread infidelity, ravaging promiscuity, and brazen display of what used to be known as sodomy, in the name of LGBTQI, etc., etc. How will you keep your body holy in this age of widespread infidelity, ravaging promiscuity, and brazen display? In recent times, we have been seeing brazen display of sodomy of what we see in Romans chapter 1 from verse 24 to the end condemnable, abominable now it is being displayed and advertised everywhere how will you keep your body holy within that kind of context in that kind of age question 4 St. Paul said the cross in our first reading he says the cross was a scandal to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. Scandal or obstacle to Jews and nonsense or foolishness to Gentiles. 1 Corinthians 1.23 In what way has the cross remained a scandal 
as well as nonsense or foolishness to many modern day Christians, including many modern day Nigerian Christians. In what way has the cross remained a scandal as well as foolishness in our day? Bishop. I have to answer question one. Question one, yes. You shall not covet your neighbor's goods. Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. What is covetousness? How is it linked to greed and avarice? Covetousness is the, the act of like design what your neighbor's. The act of? Of design what your neighbor has without. Hiding. No, desiring. Oh, desiring. Okay. Or envying what your neighbor has. Desiring what your neighbor has. Or, or envying it. Or envy for it. Ah, envy. If it is envy, covetousness is stronger than just envy. Yes. <laughs> covetousness is like when you want to take what your neighbor has by force. Their own is not enough for you. They want your. I can't hear actually. Covetousness is like, <laughs> like want to take what your neighbor has. Yeah, desiring it and wanting to take it. Yeah, it's not just envy. Envy means that your neighbor has, I mean, as, you know, um, as the children of the house are eating and the servant is, is looking in one corner and salivating. That is envy, isn't it? But desiring, covetousness is desiring. And if you have the opportunity, you grab it, you take it. And um, how does it look to greed and avarice? It is linked because if you are greedy and, and you see something as your neighbor has that is way better than your own, <laughs> you you be in your mind you'll be forced to take it. So greed fuels covetousness, right? Mm -hmm. Greed fuels covetousness, yes? Mm -hmm. Give him a round of applause. Yes, yes, that's right. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Okwo. But I want to answer question two. Yes. The meek and gentle Jesus became furious in the temple. He was furious because, or, or we notice here, Father, that the infraction that infuriated Jesus was not even betrayal or some of the things we thought should infuriate Jesus. I betray us, I okay, it was not like the betrayal of uh, Judas, the betrayal of, of Peter. That uh, was, that's not. He wasn't furious when Peter denied him. Yes, Father. He wasn't furious when he noticed that Judas had gone to sell him for 30 pieces of silver. But he displayed this holy, righteous anger because they were making profanity out of sacred place, out of a sacred place. So this is important. It is important to make that distinction that Jesus didn't get furious over the injustice that was done to him, over the violence that was done to him, over the betrayal of his most trusted allies. But he got furious when his father's house was being violated. Please take note of that. When I ask, you know, what kind of things do make you angry? That is linked with this. What kind of thing made Jesus angry? It had to do with the integrity of his father's house and his father's name. Right? Take a look at the commandments again. Take a look at that first reading. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 and 2 says, I am the one, the, the Lord your God. Thou shalt have no other God before me. So everything related. Then it says, you shall... Hold the name of the Lord your God in honor, with reverence, and everything associated with the name of the Lord. So, to what extent? Okay, let me ask you. Let me wait for him to answer that second part. Father, unfortunately, uh, what makes uh, me angry, I, 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 
uh, misguided things. I will call it misguided S anger. Sometimes you do get angry over holy things now, isn't it? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, so just sometimes. Sometimes. Uh, uh -huh. But most of the times we get angry. Don't over... condemn yourself completely. Just uh, say sometimes. Well, I want to condemn so that you raise me a little. <laughs> Father, if you, watch, if you watch the practice of Christianity in modern Nigeria, it can't get you angry. Oh, it gets pre me. Modern Christianity in Nigeria can get you angry. It gets me angry, Father. It gets me angry. Because we, we, we've left what should be, we're pursuing what shouldn't be. Isn't it, uh, Inya, isn't it Jacob who said yesterday or day before yesterday that when he watches a lot of so-called gospel music today, that he is put off, that he is an organist. And when he is on the organ, he is actually praying. But when he watches the, the, the um, display and the posture and the whatever of a lot of people who say they are singing gospel music, it's not a prayer mood. It doesn't make him, doesn't inspire him to pray. Is that the kind of thing you are talking about? Yes, Father. And, and in fact, uh, you see, looking at if one would uh, withdraw from even social media, because most of the things you see, the posts you see, I mean, sometimes I want to go to YouTube and watch your, your homily. While searching for your homily. While, you while see, there, other things are rolling in. You see things that uh, you don't want to see. But it's there. You, you just have to see them. But you see, you know why? You know the way these search engines work? They work by how many people... So, if one million people watch my post, then it will be among the things that will come first. But you know what is the, the, the number, the kind of posts that people watch? They watch the kind of post of the celebrities who uh, display nakedness, display yes. LGBT, display all kinds of things. So, those are the ones that the they companies that are doing this will put forward. Now, I'm saying... It is, the solution is not for you to stop going to social media. The solution is for you to be posting correct Good things. Inya, isn't it? Post every day and post some reflection every day and tell your friends to be downloading it or to be visiting it. Then, after seeing my own, the one that will come will be your own. The next one will be Chidebere's own. The next one will be Helen's own. Then, you will be sanitizing the social media. But then, if all of us say, we are not going to social media. What will dominate the place? And what our young people will know are the nonsense things that we are talking about. Give him a round of applause. Yes, Ellen. Father, before I answer question number four, I want to add to what he said. One of the pastors recently posted that he bought a jet during COVID and he wishes COVID would never finish. That made me so angry, Father. I didn't watch it to the end. Did you send him a message as you were angry? Uh, no, somebody, no, 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 this no, is important. No, somebody forwarded the... It, I think somebody in Yeah, the forwarded the video. We there all saw no the way. video, but I'm saying, if you were really angry, what did you do about the hunger? Because when Jesus was angry, he made a whip and chased those people out of the temple. But you were angry and you were just rolling in your house with anger. Yes. What, couldn't you have sent him a message? He can be reached. So that he knows that your own kind of Christianity does not accept that kind of nonsense talk. Okay, Father, I'll do that today. I'll search and see how uh -huh. I can. I found that from Inya. I can do it. Yes, that. you can reach him. <laughs> okay. Uh, St. Paul said... But the why are you, Inya? You are manager social Shall, media yes. at Luxterra. Is that not your description? Yes. Uh -huh. So what, what are you saying? Please, tell Inya to look for his uh, contact. <laughs> Inya, please help me. Because if we don't respond, other people who see it, they will think that's what Christianity Correct. is all about. This yes. is, before you move on, I have told you here that recently Chatham House in London Chatham House is equivalent of our Nigerian Institute of International Affairs and they have a lot of researchers there. They said they came to Nigeria and did a research and that religion promotes corruption in Nigeria. Religion is what fuels religion in Nigeria. Religion does not. I mean, we have been here taking 
taking pledge for integrity every year, right? And using, saying, let's use our religion to promote integrity. But they said they came. And if the kind of video you are talking about are the ones that are all over the place, and you do not counteract it with the kind of ones that we preach here, then what happens? Will they not be correct? They will be correct. So what is happening is that, is it Edmund Buck that says that evil will dominate when good people do nothing. do nothing? Evil will dominate. Everyone that I can see here has the capacity. Almost all of you, 99% have mobile phone, right? You have the capacity to flood the internet with good things. But you sit down there, like Helen, crying at, at home about what is going, go, going on. And you post nothing good. And the way social media works is that the more of a particular kind of post that is there, then that's the one that they will give you when you search. So if you do nothing, then these evils we are talking about will continue to dominate. The only kind of thing we can do is for each one of us to be determined today that, okay, you have come to Mass today, we have reflected on the readings. If it is one line or two that you can post to your friends and make sure that it goes wide, that is positive, that is representative of the kind of Christianity you believe in. Then you better do it. Otherwise, you sit down where you are, and if you do not know, and let me warn once again, you do not know that it is social media that is a more powerful teacher of your children today than you. You must come to recognize that. Social media is a more powerful teacher of your children. So if you are not doing things on social media so as to influence public opinion, then what will happen is that the impression of Christianity that your own children will have is what they read on social media. The impression of what has value, of what is ethical, of what is moral, that your children will have will be what they see on social media. So we cannot stop the social media. So you better get involved and post good things and post edifying things. At least to dilute all the nonsense that is all over the place. Don't, don't, don't tell yourself you are powerless. If God sent you into the world at this time, in the 21st century, God sent you into the world to redeem the world. Uh, uh, a few days, two days ago, we were dealing with Ephesians chapter 5. Uh -huh. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16. Say, the world may be evil. The world of today is evil. But what did he say? Your lives must redeem it. So the next thing is to have Andy, Nkechi, how is your life, Maureen, how is your life redeeming the world of today? How? Ask yourself, how is your life redeeming the world? By sitting down in your house and complaining, is that how your life will redeem the world? You've got to do something. Get up and do something. And learn new skills. The new media require new skills. Learn those new skills so that you may be involved in redeeming the world. If Jesus lived at this time, Jesus would have been top on social media, trying to reach the world. So don't sit down there and complain. How much social media do you know? She did like this. Not so I challenge you, Inya, please organize a course. Yes. Organize a half-day course for these people, those who are uh, immigrants of the social media. Your children are citizens of the, modern, of the social media. All of you who are above 30, 40, please let her organize a course and you come and learn how to use the social media to promote what you believe in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, you've made me feel so bad, but I'll do something. Uh, it is when people feel bad about yes, something that I they will. do something about yes, it. I yeah, will. I did it deliberately so that you will feel bad. So that you will do something about it. Yes, Father. So question number four. St. Paul said the cross was a scandal to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. In what ways has it remained a scandal as well as foolishness to many modern day Christians? Father, many modern day Christians fail to see the love of God and the sacrifice of the cross. They say that if God is all powerful, why would God have to die for man? And, you know, when I discuss with a group of people in school that we meet to discuss, and most of them are Christians, they told me that it doesn't make sense. Why would God, he could just say, man can't be saved. 
and mankind would be saying, why would he die? So to them it's foolishness because they don't understand the sacrificial love, Christ coming to die in our place to redeem us, and so on. So the bonnet day Christians, okay, Christ has done it, so why do I have to suffer? So they just sit and say that Christ So exactly the way the, um, the uh, Gentiles of those days looked yes. at it, it was seen as, it doesn't make sense. What is foolishness? It's, it, it, this is foolish. It doesn't make sense. Yes. And Christianity has never made sense along the parameters of the world. No. Christianity has never made sense. I mean, look at it. Look at it. And you say that is the son of God. And you say God is all powerful. It doesn't make human logic. It doesn't make sense. But that is what St. Paul deals with in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The foolishness of God that is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God that is greater than human strength. And like Helen is saying, till today, in our environment, the Gentiles of today who claim to be Christians have not accepted the cross. And in the example you gave before about private jets is part of the rejection of the cross, yes. for 2,000 years. Did you ever hear Christian, Christian leaders, Christian missionaries being among the rich, richest people in their environment? Did you ever hear that? Are their resources not deployed to helping the poor? Our own, churches teach, our own church teaches that the, the wealth of the church belongs to the poor. So after taking care of the altar and the minimum needs of the priests, the wealth of the church belongs to the poor. Which is why when Jacob, St. Vincent de Paul, comes to me, I can't let him go empty-handed. I would have to look for something to give him for because he is taking care of the poor on our behalf. I cannot store the money in order to buy a Lamborghini because that would be a scandal. And that is why there is no leader in the Catholic Church that you know, I'm not saying that I know, that you know, who is flaunting riches. Of course, he will be called to order. Such a leader will be called to order because he will be living, he will be violating his vow of chastity, of uh, uh, poverty. And we do that, it, is also, it also looks foolish. We do that for the sake of the gospel. So that the weakness of God, uh, of the, the, the weakness of God that is greater than human strength, so that it, is, it should be reflected in the life of the leaders of the church. Right? The foolishness of God that is wiser than uh, uh, human wisdom should be reflected in the lifestyle of anyone living the gospel. And by the way, this is not just about pastors and preachers. This is all Christians. So, a Christian who is intelligent and smart and makes a lot of money is not justified to spend all that money on himself or herself. I hope you know. I hope you know that what we are saying is not just about pastors and priests and, and so on. I hope you know that it is about every Christian. Every Christian is called to a level of frugality. Every Christian is called to embrace a measure of poverty. Especially a Christian that is living in our kind of country today with such a scandalous gap between the poor and the rich. Every Christian will be giving witness to the foolishness of God that is wiser than human wisdom, the weakness of God greater than human strength by being modest. So among critical Christian virtues are frugality and modesty and simplicity. Right? So when we discuss this, thing, don't just look at pastors and, and preachers and, and priests and bishops. Also look at Christians. Because a Christian who is known to be active in his or her church and is living scandalously wasteful life, such a Christian is as guilty as a pastor who is living scandalously uh, um, wasteful, reckless life. Yes, uh, Your bodies are temple of the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. How will you keep your body holy in this age of widespread infidelity? 
ravaging promiscuity and brazen display of sodomy. But uh, this is really um, like um, sweeping against the tide. Um, it's a tough environment. And for me, the way I think I can keep my body holy in this environment is first of all to renew my mind by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because it is from the mind or from the heart that all kinds of thoughts emanate. Renew my mind in the spirit. Yes. yes. When I have done that, I know that I have the power of God in me. And I can now defend myself in the environment I find myself. I will have to watch and pray. I will have Prayer. To so renew myself in the spirit. Watch and pray. What does that involve? What does watching? Being vigilant in the way that I associate. In what I... You know Helen's favorite quote. Be vigilant. Be on the alert. Yes. For the devil is prowling around like a roaring lion. <laughs> for the St. Peter says, Be vigilant. For the devil is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to eat so you are going to watch yeah okay i will have to accept. why were you people laughing now <laughs> is it not her favorite quote <laughs> so i have to exercise discretion in the way that i live you know in whom i associate with in what i read in what i watch in what i read in what i watch the vigilance has to be really, really strong because as uh, Azubike said, you go on, in, on YouTube to watch Father George and what stares at you, what shoots at you are all kinds of things that you didn't desire. So you need a measure of self-mastery, self-control. Uh, I don't know if any of you saw the video I saw yesterday of to show how much parents need to watch a child, like a five-year-old child, reading her books and the mother was on the other side of the table and the child was holding the book this way the child was actually watching some pornographic thing and then the mother came to check as soon as the mother got up to come she she put the, the phone on, on on the book this way as soon as the mother came she she flipped a page of the book over the phone and the mother didn't see the phone not to see what she's watching the mother kissed the child and went back the child immediately flipped back the page and was watching what she was watching. Children have become extra smart. And so the vigilance, not only your vigilance on yourself, but your vigilance over what your kids are doing. And Father, I think I have to also be active in evangelizing others. Uh, not necessarily picking up quarrels, but standing my ground and even accepting to be foolish in the face of those who think they are wise in the world. Because Religious spiritual activism, to be active. I, I have told people that, you know, we are going into another era of Christian persecution like we had in the first three centuries of the church. That is what is coming now. And that Christian persecution is not necessarily from people of other religions. It's going to be from this very secular world that has no time for any religion, that is actually discrediting religion. The, the point I made earlier of some researcher who says that uh, uh, religion fuels corruption, that's part of the persecution. That's part of trying to, to, to blackmail religion and discredit religion since they don't believe in anything. So what do you do? You, each one of us, like I said before, when we were discussing Helen's issue, each one of us has a task. It is no longer enough to just go to church and say you are a good, good Christian. To go to church is only the starting point. You must be busy doing something to reach others for God. I do say you are either actively paddling or you will sink. If you think that you can just be a backbencher in the church, by the way, you know, we said that there are no backbenchers here. If you, are, if you think that you can just go to be counted that you attended mass or you went to church, you will lose it. In today's world, 
the attacks that are coming are so numerous, so enormous, that you will lose it. If you are not actively strengthening, reinforcing your faith by sharing it with others. What I, the little I know of my faith today, I know on account of wanting to come and share with you and in that process reflecting on the readings in order that I may have something to share with you, right? Now, in that process, who gains more? You think it is you? No, I gain more. And so, if you decide to do that, if you have a circle of friends or neighbors that you do share with, then you gain more. Your faith grows even more. And finally, Father, we should know that there are costs that come with it. There are costs. To be faithful to the Lord, there are costs that come with that fidelity. Thank you, Father. Give him a round of applause. On this matter, this matter of uh, sexual promiscuity, I call it ravaging promiscuity and brazen display. I hope you know that it has split churches. There are churches that there is no problem, even though the Bible makes it clear in several passages, including Romans chapter 1, about homosexuality being intrinsically disordered. Our church holds that all practice of homosexuality is intrinsically disordered. Can you pronounce that? That means in and the act in and of itself is out of order. It does not align with nature. The moral teachings of the Catholic Church are based on what is called natural law. Everything in creation, almost everything in creation are created in couples. And the concept of copulation is a male going into a female. Something like that. There is nothing in nature that actually, unless it is an accident, accepts male going into male for sexual copulation. Or female going into female. It's not, it's, it's not natural. And because of that, the Bible teaches us that we harm creation. We harm the right order of creation when we practice homosexuality. So what does the church say? The church says, if you say we are not inside your body. So if you come and you say that I have a problem, that I'm only attracted to fellow men, the church says, oh, sorry. We will pray for you, but you can't practice it. You have to be celibate. You won't die if you don't have sex. I am a celibate. I have not died. If you come and you say you are a woman, you are not attracted to any man, so you don't want to marry because you are not attracted to any man, the church says, oh, sorry. We shall support you with prayer. But you can't practice it. Not to talk of going to say you are marrying another woman and have a, 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 you say you have a wife or you have a husband and two of you are women. It is unnatural. It is abominable. And I was speaking about this somewhere and somebody says, no, I mean, I wrote something which I will share with you after mass and I said that this is a perversion and the person says, by my saying this is a perversion that I am condemning them. Well, to say something is perversion I am not saying that the person practicing it is evil. I'm just saying the act is a perversion. And if it is a perversion, it is a perversion. The fact that it is my brother practicing it doesn't make it less of a perversion. The fact that my friend is practicing it doesn't make it less of a perversion. You and I have a problem today. Every day, not only on the social media, I am beginning to see it on the regular media, people being advertised as people who have come out. They have, they have been celebrated for coming out. The reason why people didn't come out if they had it before is that it was abominable. In traditional African society, you, it was unheard of. Now they are saying, say it on the roof, roof, rooftop that you are gay. Say it on the rooftop that you are, you are transsexual. Our country made a law against it, but every other day I see, even on TV, people being displayed and being promoted. So, like I said, there is an open display of sodomy today, and you all need to beware. 
And if you are not actively doing something about it, God forbid, your own child can come one day and say, Mommy, you know, uh, uh, I just want to tell you that, uh, you know, um, I know you won't like this. Uh, I am a lesbian. God forbid. But if you are not actively doing something about it, then we are likely to have more and more of this anomaly growing in our country. Some of you saw last week uh, the statement of the president of Ghana, right? The president of Ghana came out and said, with all that nonsense pressure from the U.S., as long as I am president of this country, homosexuality will not be legalized. And we need people to say that. We need every individual to begin to say that. If it is only these people who have these problems that are out there and are coming to the rooftop and you keep quiet, Edmund Box says, when the good people do nothing, evil tribes. The impression is that we are all doing it. Is that not why somebody came here and said, after all, Igbo women used to do it? Used to, used to marry one another and practice homosexuality? If, if, if that person in, in her environment grew up and had been hearing people say, no, this is abominable. If anybody had this problem, we consider it illness. By the way, China just a court in China just ruled that homosexuality is an illness. How many of you read it? A court in China just ruled that homosexuality is an illness. And by the way, until 1990, this yesterday, 1990, it was considered an illness in almost every part of the world. You and I have work to do. We really have work to do. Otherwise, we may have no Christianity with its dignity and integrity to offer to our children. God forbid that I should be alive when my church will accept that homosexuality is, uh, is, is okay and let people come and let the Reverend Father, let the uh, Reverend say, oh, we are all homosexuals, so no problem. I will be dead before them by the grace of God. The temple that is also called the sanctuary of the Lord was God's special dwelling place among his people. The temple was the holy of holies in Israel. The temple was built on Mount Moriah where Abraham offered sacrifice. Before the time of the temple, God's presence was represented by the tabernacle where the Ark of the Covenant was put. But built by um, uh, King Solomon, it was David who wanted to build the temple, as you know. Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 1 to 17. But God said no, and it was now King Solomon who built it in 950 B.C. Um, in 587 B.C., the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians under King Emperor Nebuchadnezzar. They used the vessels of the temple and ornaments and carried away to Babylon. Read about 2 Kings 20, uh, 24 to 25, 2 Chronicles 36, and Daniel 5. In 515 B.C., that's before Christ, the Jews returned from exile and they rebuilt the temple under King Zerubbabel. Then, still talking about the temple of Jerusalem. Now, where, where you see that uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque, what is standing there now, is as part of, it was part of where, where the temple of Jerusalem was. Okay. The child Jesus was presented in the temple on the eighth day. You remember Luke 2, 21 to 24. At the age of 12, Jesus talks with elders in the temple. Luke chapter 2, verse 41 to 47. Jesus was tempted by the devil in the pinnacle of the temple. He was taken to the pinnacle of the temple and told to jump down. Then Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple. Mark chapter 11, Luke chapter 19, and John chapter 12. Well, after the death of Jesus Christ, Acts chapter 2, verse 46, the apostles gathered with the Virgin Mary and prayed in the temple courts, meaning the outer part of the temple. They received the Holy Spirit 50 days after the resurrection and 10 days after ascension in the temple. Uh, Acts, chapter 1, verse, um, Acts chapter 1 and 2. Stephen, the first martyr, he got killed on the temple mount. Then in A.D. 62, 62 years after Christ, James, the oldest person among the disciples, was killed in the temple. He was thrown from the pinnacle of the temple. Now, 
The cleansing of the temple indicates something. And we'll do this quickly. What Jesus was doing was not just, um, he was expressing anger, but also he was teaching a major lesson. With what Jesus Christ did, the old covenant had ended. The old religion, he was putting an end to a new religion. The religion that needed goats and pigeons and rams for sacrifice. And installing a new religion that does not need all that. The religion that needed money changers, that changed money to Tyrian coin. To a new religion where you don't need that. So, money changers, ram, pigeon, sellers, etc. are necessary structures of the Jewish religion. So, what those people were doing there were legal. As we can, they were legal though, until the, Jesus is coming. They were legal. Because you needed the rams for sacrifice. And people, so, ram, in, in today's church, you need rosary to pray, right? So, in front of many churches, they sell rosary. You need Bible to pray. In front of many churches, they sell Bible. So, in those days, you needed ram and pigeons and so on. And people sell them. And when they sell them, they need change now. And in, <laughs> adult Jews were required to offer sacrifices of sheep and pigeon and pay dues with the Tyrian coin only. The priests made provision for the items to be available. And why the Tyrian coin? You can investigate that. The Jews were not, the Jews were not permitted to use coins that had the head of an emperor on it. At least not for worship. So for worship, they used the kind of coin that didn't have the head of an emperor. You can investigate that. By driving them out of the temple, Jesus was ridding the temple of the very people who provided the cult items necessary for the worship that took place in the temple. Right? In chasing them out and declaring that my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations, Jesus was making a protest action as well as passing a judgment. So, I'm talking of two things, isn't it? He was making a protest action with his righteous indignation, with his righteous anger, but also he was making a judgment. He was protesting against the commercialization of religion and the desecration of the temple. Commercialization of religion that, as I said, has become legal. So there are certain things that become legal, like homosexuality in certain churches. Does that make it right? So it can become legal. It has become legal in many countries. That doesn't make it right. So these money changing and things were legal in the temple. But Jesus Christ came and chased them out. God forbid that we should make many things legal in our day. And when Jesus comes, he begins to chase us out. Amen? The narrow, nationalistic, and exclusive view of religion by which the court of the Gentiles was considered profane. Where they sold those rams and pigeons and goats, they were called the court of the Gentiles. So it was okay to sell those things. They did not sell those things near the Holy of Holies. So Jesus says, how can you make such distinction where the Gentile can stay is profane, is secular, that you can do any nonsense there? No, no, no. The, all my people are sacred. Do you understand? He was passing judgment on the entire Jewish, Jewish religious system with the animal sacrifices that can no longer bring people to God. With Christ, animals can no longer bring people to God. The coming of Jesus Christ brings the Mosaic law to perfection. It introduces a new law which transcends the Ten Commandments which we heard in our first reading. That new law is the new law of love, the covenant of love. It, the coming of Jesus ends the old law written on tablets of stone. It inaugurates a new covenant that is written where? In the body and blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen. It is also written where? In the hearts of men and women, the new law. It brings to an end the old religion of physical temple, of material sacrifice, and of outside rituals. It now brings, introduces a new religion and a new worship, which is worship in spirit and in truth. Worship that's uh, of a transformed and purified heart. So when you go to your room and in the silence of your room and you begin to pray, it is as holy. In fact, as St. Paul says, your own heart itself is a 
temple. It brings to an end the sacrifice of rams and bulls and doves and pigeons. It replaces sacrificial worship with spiritual worship. The worship of a humble and contrite spirit. The worship of a loving and forgiving heart. Of a merciful and compassionate You know, Jesus Christ says, it is not sacrifices and oblations that I want, but a humble and a contrite heart. The old temple with its magnificence and its ritual and animal sacrifices has become irrelevant and could no longer bring people to God. Sacrifices and oblations that used to be offered in the temple have become worthless. There is no more need for money changers and sheep dealers and pigeon dealers. The physical temple is no longer the greatest sign of God's presence. No, it is no longer the place to meet God. We now meet God in his son, in Jesus Christ, in the body and in the blood of Jesus. God now makes himself known through his son, Jesus Christ, who has become the living temple. So Jesus is our new liberator. He liberates us not from the Egyptians, but from sin and the power of darkness. He is our new law giver. That law is not the Ten Commandments, but one commandment. Love God and love one another. He is our new temple, not made of wood and stones, but the temple of his body. He is our universal king. He is not accessible only to the, by the Jews, but to all men and women of all nations. So by cleansing the temple in the manner that Jesus did, Jesus was passing a judgment on the Jewish sacrificial system. He was replacing sacrificial worship with this is what he was doing. So the event we read about in today's gospel is very symbolic. It signifies many things. With the coming of Christ, believers who are satisfied or content with the old law are like people who are still going around with lanterns when electricity is available. And this is important. You know, I keep talking about it here. That there are people who prefer the Old Testament. People who quote more of the Old Testament than New Testament to guide them. They are like people, there is electricity. See? And then they are coming in with lantern. I mean, I, and I know that many people still have a problem about this. No matter how long we talk about it. Even here, there are a lot of people who still have problems. But it is in the Bible. But it is in the Bible. I keep trying to explain that there is an old covenant and a new covenant in the New Testament. I mean, in the Holy Bible. And that the one that you are bound to is what? The one you signed is the new covenant. I mean, like somebody going to the 1963 Constitution. Lawyer. And be quoting 1963 Constitution in court. You can refer to 1963 Constitution. But where there is a contradiction, which one reigns? The latest one. The cross is a sign and instrument of our salvation. The new sign of salvation is the cross of Calvary. It is a scandal for the Jews, foolishness to Gentiles. The new wisdom is still the cross of Calvary, which is foolishness of God that is wiser than human wisdom. The new source of strength for us is what? The cross of... So, see, the new sign, which is why we make the sign of the cross, which is why we hang the cross in the church, which is why we hang the cross in our homes and on our necks. The new sign of our salvation is the sign of the cross. That sign of the cross is foolishness to Gentiles, is scandal to Jews. The new wisdom is the cross. The new source of strength is the cross. So our new source of strength is not our wealth. God forbid that rather than being embarrassed if I'm surrounded with wealth that I will begin to boast about it. St. Paul says I will boast about my weakness because he knows that the new source of strength for a Christian is weakness of the cross. The weakness of no Christian should be boasting about his strength, about the property he has acquired. It's shameful. Ecclesiastes calls it vanity of vanities, all is vanity. If a Christian has too much for himself or herself, he or she should be embarrassed because he should give it away. 
The Lord has given you intelligence to acquire plenty. Give it away or set up industry that, involve, that, that um, employs so many people. What we see on the cross of Calvary is the death of sin, the death of disobedience, the death of darkness. St. Paul says, we preach Christ crucified, an obstacle to Gentiles, a scandal to Jews, but to us who believe it is the wisdom of God that is greater than human wisdom and the power of God <clears throat> that is greater than human strength. So, the old law, whereas the old law centered on avoiding sin. You see, Jesus came to perfect the law. So the old law centers on avoiding sin. If you take a look at the Old uh, uh, Testament, um, it, is, it is about avoiding sin. Look at the Ten Commandments. Avoiding this, avoid this, avoid this. But the new law is about doing good. Not so much avoiding sin. And if you are busy doing good, there will be no room to do evil. Do you get the logic? If you are too busy doing good, there will be no time to do evil. And that's what the new law binds us to. Jesus teaches his followers that approaching the commandments in a negative way leads to doing only the minimum. Those who are keeping only the Ten Commandments are doing the minimum. So to grow in the Lord... You do more than keep the commandments. You actively paddle, as I say. Do something good for God. And that's why I do now and again ask you the question, what are you doing in the world for God's sake? I am not saying, how are you keeping the commandments? Is that what I'm saying? What are you doing in the world for God's sake? What are you contributing to the furtherance of the message of Christ and the mission of Christ? Jesus gives a new vision of goodness. He says, don't just avoid evil do good. It is a better and more challenging compass to guide human action, to do good. Jesus does not abolish the laws of old, but perfects, fulfills, and transcends it. The laws of old must now be kept in the right spirit. And wherever the laws of old contradict the new law of love, which one is to go? It is the old laws that give way. And I have plenty of problems with this with my people. I say, but, but it is in the Bible. But can't you see that it contradicts the New Testament? Wherever it contradicts the New Testament, Jesus Christ says, you were told like this before, but I say this to you. What is he doing? He is saying, that is no longer relevant. I have come. Our obedience must, be, must, must not be slavish, must be motivated by love and not fear. Don't keep the laws of God in order to avoid punishment, I say. Instead, Keep the laws of God because you love him and are grateful to him. Take note of that. Don't keep the laws of God so that you may not go to hell. It's important. But more, keep the laws of God because you love him and are grateful. Don't keep the commandments so that God will love you. Keep the commandments because God loves you. Is there a difference? For Jesus Christ's religion is in the heart, not on the knees. Growth in religion can be verified in a progressive change of heart, not in the offering of sacrifice. A change of heart brings about a purification of motives. So, in the new dispensation, it's not enough that you are doing good, that you are giving money to beggars, that you are whatever. To be worthy of God, good deeds must be done with the right motives, with the right intentions. So, as Jesus walked into my, walks into my life today, let's reflect on this to end. As Jesus re walks into my life today, what and what will he need to clear out with Bulala? What and what will he need to clear out from the temple of my heart, my, from my body, from my family, from my life? What are those things, the rot, the dirt, the impurities, and the unnecessary attachments that are hold me, holding me back from serving Jesus wholeheartedly and in true fidelity. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you. We glorify your holy name. Thank you for your love and your goodness. Thank you once again for reminding us that we are temples of God. That with the coming of Jesus, it is no longer the physical building, but our hearts that the Lord desires to dwell in. May your name be praised forever. 
As we face new challenges, Lord, in the sexual area in our age, make us models of bodily integrity. Make us examples of sanctity. Help us to recognize daily and to teach our brothers and sisters that we are temples of the Holy Spirit that should be respected. Help your church to fight off the weight of the new scourge that has come upon the world today. May our children be protected from the ravages of today's sodomy. May our children be protected from the evils of our day and of our generation through Christ our Lord.